It's an only mode. Hi everyone, my name is John Davis. I am Project Supervisor for MarineDebris.info, the online discussion forum for the ocean litter research, management, and activism community. Also with me is Nick Weiner, Project Manager for MarineDebris.info. He's handling the technical side of this webinar. Mari is co-presenting this webinar with the EBM Tools Network. You may hear the voice of Sarah Carr, coordinator of the EBM Tools Network, at one point or another during this event. Uh, their website is www.ebmtools.org. Today's one-hour webinar is on a groundbreaking study. Uh, one of the longest standing questions facing the marine debris science community has been how much plastic waste is entering the global ocean annually. Jenna Jambeck uh, led a research team to answer this question, linking worldwide data on waste management infrastructure, population density, and economic status. Her findings, which she'll walk you through in this webinar, were eye-opening. Uh, this is how the webinar will work. Jenna will provide a 15-minute PowerPoint, which you, the audience, will see on your own computer screen. Then we will open the floor to questions from the audience for the remainder of the webinar. We'll conclude the webinar about an hour from now. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and we'll post the recording at marinedebris.info in a few hours. If you have a question for Jenna at any point during this, uh, this webinar, you can submit it in the question box that is on the control panel on your screen. Uh, we will be, uh, that's the webinar control panel. Uh, we will be drawing from those questions throughout the question and answer session. All right, uh, we'll get started. Uh, Jenna Jambeck is an assistant professor in the College of Engineering at the University of Georgia. Uh, she conducts research and teaches environmental engineering with a focus on solid waste. Here is Jenna Jambeck. Thanks, John. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you this afternoon. Um, so as John mentioned, I am an environmental engineering professor, and I've actually been working on waste management almost 20 years now. I just thought about the other day, and that's a long time. And when I had to choose a focus in environmental engineering, I really I fell in love with the study of waste management. Um, and this is trash, garbage, waste, whatever you know your favorite term is, um, or anything that you recycle and throw away every day. So. The reason I chose this was that it was so different from designing water, wastewater facilities, um, because it was so close to involving people. And you know, we still walk our trash um, to the curb typically, or have to choose the proper bin to put it in. And people really have strong reactions to waste as well, and especially waste management facilities, especially when they're physically close to them. But it really is something that we still create every day, and we have to manage. So as I give this webinar. I'm going to be going over a lot of numbers that went into this research, um, but as I do, I want you to kind of keep in mind the same thing that I do when I do this work, is that waste management is a really complex system, and there's always people, as well as social and cultural issues sort of interwoven into it. So the first thing I want to do is give you a little background and history um, on waste management. Uh, this is the landfill that we used as a child when I was growing up in Minnesota. We used to borrow our neighbor's truck and load our trash into it and drive to drive to this facility and back up to the edge and throw in our waste. It you know, wasn't a very formal facility. And then sometimes we just went to watch the bears. So I remember enjoying this trip, actually, and being fascinated by seeing what had been thrown away, which probably plays into the role of how I began being an environmental engineer studying waste today. Um, but it's really not so long ago. So this is less than 40 years. Uh, waste management is one of our youngest environmental engineering infrastructures. Drinking water treatment and wastewater treatment are much older. They're more established uh, and widespread, and they've really been considered historically sort of more essential to human health and sanitation. Globally, waste management tends to lag behind. And in the US, the regulations governing our waste management um, are under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, which was actually just passed in 1976. So this is um, a US landfill today, and really sort of indicative of what we see in um, developed countries. And so the landfills are really highly engineered facilities. I teach about these in my urban systems course. They're intricately designed. Um, design and operations are governed, of course, by the regulations within that country. And landfills are fined if they don't keep things like vectors and scavengers. Vectors are like rats and animals and things like that. Um, they also have to prevent and clean up litter associated with their operations. 
a closed landfill can look like a park even, and beneficial use of the landfill sometimes as a park or a soccer field. Um, and this often can occur after post-closure of facility. And in the U.S., while we still have a ways to go in some areas in terms of recycling, especially participation, we do have a fairly robust and centralized recycling system with similar anti-measures as the landfills where waste is collected, stored, separated, and baled for sale on the commodity market. So this is a landfill that I visited in Delhi, India. And really, um, this kind of facility is indicative of what we see um, in, in several waste management the waste management infrastructure we see in several developing countries worldwide. So similar to the early 1970s that we saw in the US, there's not so much formal management that occurs in scavenging by animals and people is, is really common. Um, also, in addition, formal collection is uncommon and waste that's dumped at central collection points in the city can be scavenged by recyclers. And so recycling rates can be relatively high but it's really conducted in these informal systems by millions of people in an unregulated fashion with really little containment, little formal containment of the waste and really extremely poor working conditions. So I kind of wanted to give that context and, and give an analogy of what I'm talking about today is really this interface between what we do, our activities on land and the waste that we produce and the ocean. And so as our world population continues to increase, we know that over half of our population lives on our coastlines. Our waste production is continuing to grow. And in fact, the World Bank, the, the data that we use as the foundation of this study, have estimated that we're not going to reach peak waste in this century, which means that our waste production globally will continue to grow through this century. So to get more specifically on the work that we did, I wanted to talk about this work being a part of a National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis working group out of the University of California, Santa Barbara. And the PIs of this group are Kara Lavender Law and Stephen Gaines. Um, and I was lucky enough to sort of lead this paper coming out of this group. There's other papers that will be coming out. Um, so specifically, we had the question of sort of what are all of the inputs um, going into the ocean, looking at this a little bit differently than how others have in terms of looking at where we're finding plastic in the ocean, which is also extremely important. And so as we thought about those inputs, we sort of on initial calculations noticed that hmm, this probably this mismanaged waste input is going to be a significant part of this global input. And so we set about trying to estimate that. Now, the last time you've heard of sort of this global input of waste into the ocean was from 1975. And this was put out by the National Academy of Sciences. But this was, of course, before MARPOL, which is the international treaty regulating like the dumping in the ocean. And it was also all ocean-based. It was ocean-based waste and all waste in general, not a particular waste. So this is the first time this has been a land-based input. And we also focused on plastic. Um, one thing I wanted to mention about the NC's working group is that it was a really great international and interdisciplinary work. And so just even on this paper alone, we had oceanographer, statistician, polymer scientist, industrial ecologist, and also another uh, solid waste expert. And then the group at large contained even more people, um, like microbiologists and, and ecologists, et cetera. So how did we do this? So Initially, um, <clears throat> we started with 192 countries that have a coastline in the world and a population of 100 people or more. And we took a 50-kilometer buffer because proximity matters in terms of this estimate for waste being able to actually reach the ocean. And so we looked at the population density within that 50-kilometer buffer. We also then categorized the countries by their gross national income or their economic status, which we know is coupled directly with per capita waste generation. And so then we had the per capita waste generation of each country. And I wanted to mention all this data came either directly from the World Bank or models then that we produced from data from the World Bank. And so once we had the population density and the per capita waste generation, we looked at the percent plastic in that waste stream. And then from there, we needed to <clears throat> look at the waste that's mismanaged. 
in those countries, and that's made up of two components. One is inadequately managed waste, and what we mean by inadequately managed waste is that waste that's not managed in an organized system. And so it's typically open dumped or available for um, available to be released into the environment. And then as you can see from this picture, so even though you know people are working with this waste, if you can imagine if there was either a bad storm or wind, um, you know, so it's very easy for this kind of you know uncaptured waste to be blown or washed in either directly into the ocean or into a waterway that then can lead to the ocean. And then the other component of mismanaged waste is the percentage of waste that's littered. So once you have that waste that's mismanaged, we had um, three estimates, a low, mid, and a high estimate of what quantity of this waste actually reaches the ocean. So, um, and we called those scenarios. So what did we find? So this data, um, the data that we that we had available to us from this report, which was very current when we started this work, but it took a long time. So, um, so the so the year that we did this for was 2010, and so I'm going to walk you through this infographic. And um, starting from the left, you can see that in 2010, 270 million metric tons of um, plastic resin was produced globally, and that's just sort of to provide some context. Obviously, as that has continued to grow, we've actually seen increases of plastic in the waste stream. So that same year, we saw 275 million metric tons of plastic in the waste stream in the countries that we worked with. And now, not to worry that those numbers don't match exactly. They didn't, shouldn't necessarily match exactly. And it's sort of just interesting that they are as close as they are, because of course, you have plastic goes into both durable goods, which means goods that are sort of in service life for longer than a year. Think of maybe the table or desk that you're sitting at has um, probably some plastic in it, or the chair you're sitting on. And then, um, and then of course, you have non-durable goods, which go into the waste stream within um, the year that you use them, or potentially for single-use items, maybe within a few minutes of using them. Um, so you have that. That's how you contribute the products to the waste stream. OK, so then from there, you can look at that 50-kilometer buffer, right? And so the quantity of waste that's produced within that 50-kilometer buffer um, is 99.5 million metric tons of plastic waste within that coastline area. And then from there, the quantity that um, was mismanaged globally was 31.9 million metric tons. And then from there, we had our three scenarios going from 4.8 to 12.7 million metric tons. And so just for some context, then, we also then can show you what has been quantified floating. And now, of course, not all, um, not all resins float or polymers float, right? So mostly that's going to be your polyethylene and polypropylene that float, and then um, others could be somewhere else. And so um, there's lots of sinks, so some of them on the seafloor, right, to the PET sink, some of them in the sediments. They've been found in sea ice. Um, you know, on our shoreline, so we have all kinds of potential sinks. But in terms of what's floating, you know, this estimate of, of 6,300 to 245,000 metric tons, which of course is at least one order of magnitude smaller than what we estimate going in. Um, so the other thing you can see here are some mitigation options, and I'm going to talk about those in a little bit more detail um, after the next slide. So this next slide, because our foundational unit for this work um, is this country-level data, of course, we have data for each country and each of these 192 countries. And they're in a spreadsheet that's available for download, um, either from its reference sort of in the paper or it's also available on my website. And I could, well, there's a link to my website at the end of the talk. So you could go there. And there's, there's a page called Land Plastic Input that you can um, get the spreadsheet from. And also the infographic is shown there. So, but um, but this is not about pointing fingers. Our world we our world is very globalized, right? And so, um, but what is interesting is to really be able to talk about some of the influencing factors that relate to to sort of making this map, which of course is a snapshot of this 2010 data, right? It would have looked different five years ago, and of course it would look different 10 to 20 years in the future. And so. Um, 
So what we noticed in terms of our influencing factors were really population density. It, it had, a, had a heavy influence in this. And then, of course, the inadequately managed waste, which what we're kind of seeing is in really rapidly developing economies. As I mentioned, the, the waste management infrastructure can lay, can lay behind. Um, and of course, as I mentioned also, your per capita waste generation is coupled with economic growth. So when you have this quick economic growth, you have a large um, you also have that coupled with your per capita waste generation increases. And then so sort of just keeping up with the management of that um, is challenging. And also the other thing that's happened is that our waste stream has changed so significantly. So just thinking about the increase in the resin production globally, having an increase of nearly, well, 647% since 1975 of production, we've seen a huge change in our waste stream as well, going from hardly any plastic to 13 or more percent in some cases. And so, um, and so people who you know had historically maybe just thrown pottery or but at used banana leaves or something like that are now using plastic and, and not having anywhere to manage that material as the same as they did historically. Um, the other thing that's interesting to look at is that in developed areas and especially for example, like the U.S., again, population density is a driver. So even in our case, where we have no inadequately managed waste, our only mismanaged waste is from litter, um, our per capita waste generation is significant enough um, to show an input from, from us as well. So the other thing we did then was to project forward. And the reason we did this was to show that if business as usual were to continue. So we weren't, we're trying to show if we don't improve our waste infrastructure um, globally or make any other changes in terms of waste reduction, et cetera, this is the picture that we're going to see. And so what happens that by 2025, the quantity going in annually um, nearly or doubles to about 17.1 million metric tons and that cumulatively by then, and in mid-estimate, we would be looking at about 155 million metric tons. So what can we do? Um, so we have this, the neat thing about this framework that we developed then is not only to do some of these projections, but also to be able to look at some of these mitigation strategies. So even just reducing that um, mismanaged waste by 50% in our in the top 20 countries by 2025, then you can reduce the input um, by 41%. And sort of this combination of looking at um, waste reduction strategies and improving infrastructure um, significantly, especially in the top 10 countries, you could actually have this reduction of 77%, um, which would be great. So um, one other thing. I wanted to bring up, kind of bring you back to this again to talk about the mitigation options. So I kind of talked a little bit about reducing plastic in the waste stream and improving infrastructure. But also, I think in some ways, we're always going to have some of this litter and some of these issues related to loss of waste, sadly. But um, thinking about capture, so even just uh, technology related to stormwater systems and, and capturing trash with, within those. And um, one of my favorite examples of another interesting use or application of this, I should say, is the Baltimore water wheel, where they have this solar and water-powered wheel that's collecting um, all of the floating debris in um, the Baltimore Harbor. And then finally, from that, I think that also for awareness and education, um, as well as you know, keeping the the debris out of the ocean in the first place, it's much easier to clean it up on land and be aware of it there than once it gets into the ocean. A, we're not even sure where it's going. And actual cleanup of of small particles of plastic once it turns to microplastic is um, challenging, if not impossible. And so, um, I wanted to mention this tool that we had developed here at the University of Georgia as well. It was focused, um, or was a feature, excuse me, in the EBM toolkit um, tools. And so you can also locate it there on, on that website. Um, or you can visit us directly at the University of Georgia. So what we did quickly was develop an app. And um, if you see litter or debris anywhere in the world, it can be inland. Our largest tracker, individual tracker, is in Omaha, Nebraska. And um, I used it in the open ocean last year as well.
you just simply tell us about it and um, it immediately goes into our database and is available online for download and, and also shown um, in, as immediate feedback on the website. So what are the goals here? Less error without you know, replacing paper and pen. We also get more data. You still, the, the volunteer or the person using it still tells us the same thing. Here's what I found. Here's a count. But we get so much more data. We get the GPS coordinate, time and date stamp. Um, you have near real-time data gathering and upload capabilities. You have really easy access and download to the data that comes out in Excel. And um, we just we have people all over the world using it, researchers to citizens to citizen scientists. So the biggest thing is that individuals as well who maybe can't be a part of large cleanup groups really feel like they're part of a, of a global effort in a community. We have a really strong um, online community that people um, really feel a part of. So we have, as I mentioned, um, some global reach. We've had over 12,000 downloads, and our surpassing data comes in every day, which is great, um, surpassing 46,000 entries. And of course, you can say I've found several cigarette butts here, for example. And so it's actually equals more than 40, 438,000 items logged. And some of our partners, this was developed in, um, and funded by NOAA. Marine Debris Program originally, and the Georgia Sea Turtle is one of our largest users. And um, One More Generation is starting to use it in their curriculum and schools, et cetera. And we're always um, open to, to having more partners join on. And one of the new capabilities with the new version is to um, put in your own list. So if you have a certain list that um, your community uses, you could actually have your own individual list in there. But the default list, which is very easy to use, is NOAA's um, shoreline protocol list. So just as a quick kind of thinking forward and other work that we do here in our lab, we're working on a count to mass conversion. So um, if you're familiar with marine debris work, um, you know that most of that work and litter work as well is done in count. But uh, coming from the waste management world, as I do, we do everything in mass. And so to get those two data sets to talk to each other, which we grade, especially when we're looking for where is this plastic going and quantifying what we're finding on beaches, et cetera, we need to have the mass of what we're seeing. And so what we've done is take samples of marine debris from all over and dry them and remove the sand and then weigh individual items so that hopefully if someone gives us a count of items, we can fairly accurately convert that to a mass. Um, and so hopefully that's a paper that would come out later this summer. I also have a master's student doing some plastic fragmentation studies, excuse me, based upon UV temperature and mechanical mixing. And then I'm also working on particle size distribution of plastics um, from an open ocean sailing trip called X Expedition that I went on last fall and some of their future trips. And we're trying to actually look at particle sizes smaller than the 333 micron that are typically captured in the, um, the trial sampling. And then, of course, I'm still working on a few of the papers coming out of the NC's working group, so you can be looking for those, um, which focus on some of the other input sources, as well as um, some of the sinks and where the plastic might be going. And then some more localized inputs, um, as opposed, now the framework is developed, we can also then tailor that to look at region-specific or country-specific areas. And so that's all I have, and I'm happy to take questions now. That's great. Thank you very much, Jenna. Uh, again, to the audience, I'm John Davis of MarineDebris.info. Uh, we'll now open up this webinar to the audience for the next uh, about 35 minutes. If you have a question for Jenna, and some of you have already done this, uh, you can submit it in the question box that's in the control panel on screen, the webinar control panel, and we'll be drawing from those questions throughout this question and answer session. Uh, Jenna, I just have a, a quick question for you. You mentioned the other day that uh, since this paper came out, you've been contacted by a number of people around the world with questions about it. What's been the nature of the interest uh, that your paper has received? Are, are the people who have contacted you mostly municipal managers, coastal managers, researchers? What's been the nature of that response? So, um, well, for the first, <laughs> first few weeks, it was mostly all reporters. Um, and interestingly enough, it's been... It's, it's been a, 
I wouldn't say there's like one certain focus. It's really been a diverse cross section. And and one of the entities that I think um, that has contacted me that that you didn't mention, but because all that you have mentioned me definitely um, municipalities and. Um, I think just people with general interest as well, some some students and researchers for sure, um, but industry, surprisingly enough, people that um, are just saying, "Wow, you know, this is what we're kind of interested in hearing." And so, um, yeah, just I, I was shocked kind of by, by some of that feedback. I mean, I guess not shocked, but surprised by by some of those people reaching out to say, "Hey, this is really interesting work." and we're trying to work on this. And of course, people that make bioplastics, <laughs> several of those industries have reached out to. So um, you know, people that have solutions, people that are trying to work on this issue, and then people that are trying to raise, raise awareness on the issue, I would say, are sort of the top three. That's great. Thanks, John. Uh, do you feel the use of biodegradable plastic for disposable items is a viable solution to this? So um, I think that's a, it's a really, it's a question that needs to be explored further. I think what, so there's, there's a few, I guess, definitions of bioplastics. So there's plastics that are made from, from, not from petroleum sources, and then actually how those then degrade in the environment, I think, needs to be known. And then there's, plastics that are sort of meant to um, biodegrade in the environment. So I think you have to kind of define and make sure you know what you're talking about when you're, when you're looking at those. I think ultimately we need, we need to look and see what happens in the marine environment with those to make sure, A, it's not causing an unknown, unintended consequence or, or something that's unknown. And I think what's challenging, though, about this is that, you know, plastic is was produced to be durable and to hold you know, specifically a lot of single use or for food packaging, right? So to be durable and, and hold this item and keep it fresh and it has all these requirements associated with with its purpose and then those are sort of almost directly go against it, you know, being something that would dissolve easily in the environment. And so I think that that's the real challenge. Okay, thanks. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions coming in, which is fantastic. Okay. And um, please keep it up, audience. <laughs> this is this is awesome. Um, does your data provide specific estimates of plastic inputs for each coastal jurisdiction? Um, okay, so I'm not sure what the definition of of jurisdiction is, but we do have, you know, based upon since we have population densities, um, you know, then per country per person, so. Certainly, um, I, I think that population density maps would sort of be the most informative, I guess, in terms of sort of sort of looking at that. Um, but no, in, ter in, in terms of other realms of sort of mismanaged waste, that is a countrywide estimate. And so those sort of maps, I guess, that you produce with this would be very, would basically be influenced by population density. And so, um, and so that's sort of the most informed, I guess, you can get to, down to jurisdiction. So I would say it's, it's definitely more of a country level. OK. Do you know of anyone working on the human behavior uh, change aspect of these issues? And if so, have you been pulled into any projects uh, working on that? Um, so the most re I did re um, see a report uh, by Richard Thompson, and that was looking at more of gathering um, fishing, like working with fishermen. And when I worked in New Hampshire, we did work with the marine extension there um, a lot with fishermen, which is outside of the scope of this, right? We were looking at municipal waste. And so the behavior aspect, I feel, really kind of relates to the litter. Um, and I actually haven't been approached by anyone um, related to that. And I think the behavior associated with sort of the inadequately managed waste is, is much more sort of this cultural and social and sort of economic development issue. And so um, I, you know, I guess I don't have any other specific names of, to give in terms of those doing behavioral research, but um, I do think it's an interesting aspect of it and it's an interest of mine as well. So if the question is, am I interested in that, the answer is yes. 
Okay, excellent. I thought one interesting part of your your study and the presentation is, um, I mean, you started off the presentation talking about how waste management in the U.S. has gotten better, right. and yet when you take a look at the um, the map of countries, the U.S. is not one of the lightly colored ones. We're, right. we're producing uh, plastics that go into the oceans. What do you think would be a good example of a well-managed waste management site or, or a, uh, on a broader scale, a country that really has its act together on waste management? And what does that look like? Yeah, so, um, so yeah, so keep in mind that the U.S., so I said the influencing factors for the U.S. are, um, it's, so it's litter and our per capita waste generation. So, um, so if we kind of look at, look and see, you know, what kind, and then I, I don't have a specific country, but I can give you a few examples then for countries that, um, of some things that I think are some good things that are going on. So um, Japan is one of those countries that is very, it's developed um, with a high standard of living, and they actually have a low per capita waste generation around that 1.7 kilograms per person per day, um, where we're looking at saying, you know, can we, can we be about that? be at that point. Um, and then just other, I think, capture programs, although when I'm talking about, you know, capturing and collecting and containing waste, I don't say that it necessarily has to be recycled, but I think that recycling programs also um, play an important role in this. Um, and so I know that Norway has a 90-some percent recycling rate for PET bottles because they have um, a system where you just take them back to the to the stores and, and you can redeem them there and, and they think they get credit for the grocery store right there. Um, and so I think there are various examples like that around the world that have some, um, some innovative things that are happening. I think challenges within the U.S. are that we have um, individual state. Waste management is, is fairly decentralized and um, probably maybe even everyone on this call has, has gotten to a recycle bin and not sure what they can put in it in a public place. And, you know, I think that um, that there's just a lot of differences even not only with between states but between localities, locales within states. And so that just, again, plays into this role of why sort of waste management can be this complex issue. Thanks, Jenna. Um, we have a question here from Laura Miller. Uh, that I think it it um, it connects your research with a couple studies that have come out in the past year or so, which looked at uh, how much of the plastic uh, that gets into the oceans ends up staying at the surface, and how much uh, goes somewhere else, whether it's uh, down to deeper depths or um, gets deposited on beaches around the world. Yeah. So the question is, did I understand the infographic correctly? There is an estimated 8 million metric tons of plastic going into the ocean, but only thousands floating, meaning there's a significant amount suspended or that is sunk to the bottom of the ocean. What are your thoughts wearing your waste management expertise hat on the, the other studies that have come out about what happens to plastics once they get into the ocean, and how does that um, connect with your research? Yeah, so I think um, I think those other studies are great. I mean, they've made these robust estimates from where they've looked in the ocean and what they found. Um, I think some challenges are that the ocean, the ocean is so big. I mean, it's seventy percent of our planet, and I just think about even characterizing. You know, also in waste management, I've done remedi remediation engineering. I worked for a consulting firm for a while, and so let's just say we had fifteen acres of land that we had to um, classify the soil, how many, you know, soil samples we'd have to take for those 15 acres, it's a lot, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds, and, you know, so then the ocean not only is so large and how many samples we'd have to take, and then it's moving, so those are just some of the challenges, and so I think people who have samples have, you know, they're doing the best that they can, and those estimates um, are good, and the challenge is, is that once it is in the ocean, we haven't been able to get to everywhere that it's going to quantify it. So we do have that those estimates of, of floating plastic globally. Um, and then, of course, we do have an unknown quantity in the depths 
um, probably unknown quantities within sort of sediments and estuarine systems, um, unknown quantities within sea ice, and also I think what's important is that even though we we have this estimate of going in, there's areas in the world that are like deposition beaches and deposition areas, and so those are actually beaches where things tend to wash up on shore and, and potentially back out um, and back up, but one of the beaches that I visited on my journey last fall was in the Canary Islands, and with every wave, microplastic was washing up onto the beach. It was really, and I had never witnessed anything like that before. Um, but there's beaches that are, are that as well. So I think the challenge is that once it's sort of released into our environment, it's, it's, it's very challenging to quantify, um, and we're finding it just about everywhere we look. Great, thanks. Um, we have a number of questions uh, about the the management of waste in developing nations. Where uh, I mean, we we saw the photos that that you had on screen of some of the you know pretty much almost unmanaged um, dump sites. Right. Um, how do you suggest? I mean, where where do you start? with reducing mismanaged waste in countries where there's currently no waste management infrastructure and sometimes no resources, or right. perhaps desire at this point to manage the waste. Are there some outside the box uh, ways of doing it which don't involve having to do the heavy lifting of putting infrastructure in place? Hmm. That's a great question. and. Um, so a couple things come to mind. For, first of all, I think that um, there, I, I've talked about some of the solutions before, and I think you have to have both these global and local um, kind of working in cohort. And I think that the right people based upon, um, I think just the past year and sort of attention to this issue and all of the different papers that came out and, and the new data that's coming to light that the right people are sort of talking about this globally. But And so you're going to need to have buy-in from all of these stakeholders, including government um, and industry and NGOs at this global level. The Ocean Conservancy is um, really working hard on this issue. Um, the State Department is involved now and the Global Ocean Commission. You know, recently had a meeting, and, and these were pretty high-level meetings with the right people involved that can hopefully make things happen. And many of these people are thinking about outside-of-the-box issues and really involving industry, um, seeing this as an externi externality to their um, operations. And so um, I think that's really important. I think the other thing that is also important is sort of these local grassroots efforts and these um, uh, sort of solutions, I guess I would say, at the local level. Um, some of them still involve some of these larger stakeholders, but a couple examples. I want to give our interfaces project within the Philippines where they're taking um, fishing nets. And of course, this isn't municipal waste, but you can, of course, think about how this also could be applied. Um, fishing nets that are collected and um, refining those, but paying the community, starting a community bank, and really kind of starting a different economy there. Um, or adding to the economy, I should say, for them to collect these nets and supply them then, and they're making recycled carpet tiles out of them here in Georgia. Um, the other is a skateboard company. They're taking recycled fishing nets in um, Chile and making skateboards. And so you could think about just scaling those kind of solutions up into various areas. And I do think it's going to take out-of-the-box thinking because um, these formalized systems and building this infrastructure may not be the way to go in every country if they already have millions of people working in an informal waste management sector. How can we formalize that in the way that those people get to keep their jobs, but their working conditions are improved and you are helping, you know, even if they just had a building to work in, then we wouldn't be seeing some of these releases of this waste into the environment. And so maybe the infrastructure isn't these you know, huge landfills or, you know, what we've seen sort of in our westernized environment, but maybe it's, it's something different. But I think the key is um, improving their working conditions for sure and then making sure that we capture and actually contain the waste. Uh, along that line, you mentioned the Baltimore water wheel, which I, I just think is such a great device. <laughs> Me too. Uh, and and we, did a, we did a webinar on it um, a few months ago. And oh, nice. 
yeah, the, the recording of that is on marinedebris.info in case anybody wants to go back and listen to that. Uh, but do you see that or some, some similar device? I mean, would you like to see that on like every river around the world? Um, do you think that would be a good use of uh, resources, financial resources to do that? Or um, do you think that there are other ways that money can be more um, efficiently used? That's a good question. Um, probably I'd have to, you know, do, you know, to actually quantitatively look at that. But I think, you know, uh, being optimistic that we can hopefully keep, you know, as much as we can, people, you know, affect people's behavior, make sure it gets into the right bin. But the, I guess the sad part is that even in the U.S. where we have, you know, great infrastructure, we still end up with this kind of material being littered. And so unless we're changing some other component of the system to impact that, I think those technologies are needed. Or I think that would be a really good use of a technology because it's better to get it before it gets into the ocean. I think that's sort of the key. And if that's our final point, if that increasing that final capture is is what we think, you know, is is where we think we're going to actually be able to solve this, then I do think it's important. But certainly it would make it much easier to do it upstream. And, and, I, and I've heard the water wheel folks say this as well. They're not saying, you know, we shouldn't do anything upstream because we have the water wheel. No, of course not. We, but in order to get any of that final stuff um, that still is there, even though we've tried to even you know look at more of a circular economy and redesigning products and looking at material substitution and waste reduction all of those things we should think about but then um, if we still are seeing an issue then I think that technology is is great I mean it's solar operated and water operated and and you know it's not impacting the environment negatively why not yeah, yeah, it's a pretty elegant device. Um, we've we've gotten a couple uh, questions on marine debris tracker, which you mentioned at, at the end of your presentation. I'm really glad that you did. Great. Um, do you, how do you use the information that you're collecting from that, and do you encourage people to throw away the trash that they're logging? Does it double yeah. as kind of a, a beach cleanup? Uh, thing? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, we're very hopeful that that people are collecting. I mean, certainly some of the open ocean data, um, it, you know, that's not possible. But the but the um, the on land data that people are collecting, yes, we do encourage them to pick it up and throw it away. Of course, we do have some of the NOAA protocols on there in terms of like hazardous, be careful of hazardous materials and whatnot. We don't directly say you must do this. You know, kind of it's you do it at your own risk, but certainly encourage that and in most cases the people that communicate with us are saying yes I'm picking up litter and you know this is what I'm doing um, and darn now I forgot the, what was the first part of the question uh, how are you using the data oh yeah yeah so um, so a couple things so some of our partner organizations like the Georgia Sea Turtle Center has already published a paper in marine pollution bulletin and you could look up that. Um, that's by Jeannie Miller Martin. And then we, um, my cohort, co developer, and I um, have a paper coming out this summer in computing and science and engineering. And that's really about sort of the whole um, citizen science component. It's a citizen science special issue of Marine Debris Tracker. It was originally this outreach and education tool, um, and it did bring in people into this community that weren't a part of the community before, and that was the whole um, sort of the purpose, is to reach people who enjoy technology and their smartphones and say, do you know about this issue, and, and you know, help us not only raise awareness, but then contribute to help fixing it. Um, and this is opportunistic data, so we need a lot of it to be able to do like these more robust scientific analysis. But I'm I, I wasn't sure that we were ever going to get to that point when we first released it. But I'm certain now that we are. And so um, even in this this count to mass work that I'm doing, I'm going to look at applying that to the marine debris tracker data. And so that should be a part of that publication. And then again. Definitely, there's locales. Certainly, Omaha, Nebraska, and Jekyll Island, Georgia. We could start to say some um, scientifically robust things about, but hopefully, globally, as as more data comes in. So, the more data, the better for opportunistic kind of data collection, um, and it also helps the issue. 
That's great. Thanks, Jenna. Um, we have a couple questions about the methods in your study. And just want a, a quick note to the audience. If you've not been able to see the, um, the journal article, uh, we, we recognize it's, it's behind the Science Magazine uh, paywall. Uh, but if you, if you would really like to see it, um, there's always the option of contacting the lead author at the risk of filling up your inbox, Jenna, with, <laughs> with okay. That's requests. Great. But that, that uh, is a, um, mm -hmm. a useful way of getting um, journal articles behind paywalls. Right. And just... there's lots of details in the supplemental materials, too, which I can provide. Excellent. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, but one, one quick methods question. Can you be more specific about the definition of coast for your 50-kilometer buffer? Uh, for example, Baltimore, uh, which I assume the, the question asker is, is from, is on the tidal Chesapeake Bay, but is more than 50 kilometers from the Atlantic. Would Baltimore or similar cities be on the coast? Hmm. Um, I would have to look m more specifically, but I believe that they would be. So I think, I guess technically, yeah, so the Chesapeake Bay is there, but, um, but I do believe that that would be, that was considered as a part of, as a part of the coastline. Um, but I can, con I can confirm that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's a good question, but, mm -hmm. Uh, another question um, on plastic production. Since plastic production results in plastic wastage, is, um, is having a strategy for mitigation of wastage in plastic production also appropriate, and what can be done in this regard? Um, mitigation for wastage in plastic. Oh, oh, so like during the plastic production. So this exactly. is probably like industrial waste. Right. Do you think? Um, okay, so... Um, well, I'm certainly, I mean, that, so industrial types of waste weren't taken into account here. This was only like products that would be, you know, entering the consumer marketplace and then, um, and then contributing to this waste stream. But as far as I know, I mean, industrial waste is managed fairly differently. Oftentimes, industrial waste, especially if it's sort of virgin from production, is oftentimes recycled um, into other processes. If it's not, then, you know, then it is, you know, then it is a part of the waste stream, but um, that, that's just not part of the scope of what we did, and so I can't I necessarily comment on reducing that. It wouldn't, it wouldn't impact this number either way. Yeah, thanks. Um, one of the most striking visual um, takeaways from your study is uh, obviously the map and China which it's <laughs> really dark compared to, uh, to the other countries. And this is a question that I had for you the other day, and someone else asked it today. Have you, have you gotten any response from the Chinese government? Uh, and more generally, do government officials accept uh, the values that you've uh, come out with uh, as part of the study? So, um, so interestingly, I mean, I haven't talked to spoken directly with the Chinese government. Um, I've spoken with um, some people that are in that area, some NGOs um, that are in Asia, and no one has said, no, you know, oh, wow, this, does, this doesn't look right. Um, for the majority of people that have contacted me have said, yeah, um, you know, this is, this is what we're seeing. I mean, this is what we see, and, um, you know, you can't look at something and saying, is this quantity right? But in terms of the visual um, sort of confirmation or visual input, um, people are, are saying, yeah, this makes sense. Uh, the other thing I want to say for specific countries, though, and, and when I put up the map, I didn't, um, I didn't say this then, but, you know, because this is a global estimate and we had to use country-level data, um, similar to the U.S., I guess, and you know, how there's different states within the U.S. and different things going on. Within these countries, there's, there's these different urban centers and um, on-the-ground estimates would be, would be needed. So if you were going to dive in, say, to a country and say, what do we want to do here now? We highly, I mean, we, we absolutely recommend that you go in and actually do sort of an on-the-ground estimate of waste that you see there um, because, you know, we we can dive incredibly deep into every single of these 192 countries. We had to take this country-level data. And so 
definitely as a global estimate, this is robust. But in terms of, of looking at these numbers, we had to use World Bank data and sort of systematically not just sort of go in and replace or refine things, right? Because we, we needed to treat this all the same. And so, um, you know, people have looked at various countries on this list and said, hmm, I'm not, you know, what do you think about this? And I'm like, well, you need to, you know, <laughs> this, you know, maybe tiny this or that. But, you know, it's um, in terms of sort of when we shifted things. So we did some sensitivity analysis as part of the review process for this. And while maybe a country would jump here or there based upon some changes, um, you know, even in, the, in we modeled the inadequately managed waste um, based upon the empirical data from the World Bank. Um, some differences in doing that, a country might jump one or two, but the really the top 20 always stayed the same. And so, um, so it, it's it's really robust in that way. But we recommend going into those countries. So I think, I guess the bottom line of that question is, it's no one has said we don't think that this is what's going on. We and China, you know, there's a recent paper that came out quantifying the informal waste management recycling infrastructure, um, and they were talking about some of their initiatives. I mean, they this is on their radar, um, and you know, I think that they recognize that it's an issue and are trying to address the problem as they can. So, and I think there's countries now globally willing to work with them on it as well. That's great. Thanks. And the other stakeholders too, I guess I should say. More than countries, other stakeholders, yeah. That's great. Thanks, Jenna. Uh, I have a question here. What are the most important research gaps related to the impact of plastics in the oceans? And that, that gets a... Um, one of the things that I think is most valuable about this study and about your involvement in the field, Jenna, is that it is coming from uh, an, uh, an area of expertise in waste management. A lot of the studies that are in this field of, of marine debris um, and marine debris management are, are done by biologists. Uh, whereas you come from a, um, a relatively unique background in our field and a valuable background. With that perspective, uh, and with a perspective gained from your work with the great NCS group that's producing all, all this really useful information on marine debris, what do you see as the remaining gaps um, that, that are most in need of filling research-wise? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And you're right, I am sort of this unique entity, because in my world, some people are like, you're researching what <laughs> in, in environmental <laughs> engineering? and and waste management even. So I've definitely been outside the box. And then I'm sort of outside the box in, in sort of the marine debris community too. So um, so thanks for having me. <laughs> um, but, but so, you know, mine sort of goes back to this lane. I mean, immediately when I learned about, I learned about this issue in 2000 when I was just starting my PhD work. And I had, you know, previously from a master's work been fascinated by studying waste management and, and knew that I was going to focus on that. And then I heard about this issue and I'm like, that's it because I, I care deeply in, I, about the ocean and know the importance and, and love it. And so I was like, that's what I want to study. And in 2000, well, forget it. Nobody, I mean, literally people said no one cares about that. And so I luckily didn't really listen and, you know, and still tried to keep connecting the two, my world and this, this world of of marine debris in the ocean. Um, but yes, it does kind of go back to land. So questions in my mind are like, how, um, you know, how does this waste actually get to the ocean? We know some washing and blowing, but I have an interest in sort of looking at some of the the um, watershed, the actual watershed inputs um, and, and, you know, the actual travel of, of some of this trash sort of into through those watersheds and um, into the ocean. And so that's sort of this, sort of a little bit of a science-y, you know, engineering perspective. But, I, but certainly I think that um, what this paper and sort of the other papers came before bring to light is where is this plastic going. And so if you think of sort of the, the risk um, to the ocean, it, and that's a part of um, Risk is two things, right? It's, it's um, hazard and exposure. And I, I'm not the person to, to look at the hazard part, but there's other people, right, who are looking at impacts and, and what, you know, what are the impacts of the plastic and the microplastic and this and that, either on ecosystems or wildlife or um, up the food chain, et cetera. And then there's exposure. And so this um, 
our paper really informs exposure because the quantity that's there is matters and that that describes exposure. But the other thing that describes exposure is where is it? And so I think um, that question right now really is is where we need to kind of focus and try and figure out because where it's going is really going to inform what that what the risks are. Yep. All right, we, we had a question about um, recording of this webinar, which I'll quickly answer. Uh, yes, this is, this is all being recorded, and we'll be posting the recording on the marinedebris.info website in a, in a few hours. We'll also send a link to that recording to the marinedebris.info listserv so that people can, can listen to this um, whenever they'd like. Uh, I have a macroeconomics question for you, Jenna. Uh, the low cost of oil is impacting, the currently low cost of oil, uh, is impacting the recycling of plastics. Does that factor into your mitigation recommendations and or your uh, projections of, um, of plastic um, production and, and plastic waste production in the future? So the, the short answer to that sort of quantifiably in turn, or, the, or the direct um, input of that is, is no, right? So we're just, we basically, our plastic um, increase in the waste stream is sort of based upon historical increases that we've seen. And, and while the resin production has increased tremendously, the plastic in the waste stream has actually increased very small, small amounts. Um, I think it was like 0.19% sort of annually in the waste stream. Um, but certainly in terms of the the economics or materials flow of plastic and the fact that, yes, oil is cheap. And the other thing is that plastic um, is being made from natural gas now as well. And so you really, you know, the, the fact that the virgin materials for creating, um, for creating this are, are inexpensive, it's, it's sort of hard to then value um, the waste stream. But I think if we look beyond just those um, you know, those really specific costs and think about some of these other externalities, then, then I think you can, you know, provide a higher value on the waste material. And um, I think that's happening. I mean, I've, I've seen that happening in the fact that they're, you know, collecting the fishing nets and um, there's a place called the Plastic Bank, I think, that's actually collecting waste off of beaches. And the fact that people are starting to think more beyond just sort of those um, sort of that narrow view of economics is where we'll start to see um, this waste to have more value. That's great, thanks. Um, we have a couple minutes remaining time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, here, here are two which are kind of related. Um, were you able in your analysis to account for situations in small island developing states, particular many, many of which are heavily dependent on tourism? that may significantly influence both total waste quantities generated and or composition of waste. Uh, and there was a question on China uh, with regard to, um, did you account for the fact that a lot of the waste that is being recycled in China is coming from the US and, uh, and other countries, which are basically shipping our recyclables to China? Right, right, right. So, um, yes, those are related, and I'll try to. <laughs> those are really big questions for one minute left. Um, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay. So quickly with the island nations. So some of those, some of the the actual waste management numbers from those countries reported incorporate some of that data related to to tourism, et cetera. But at the same time, um, you know, like just even for example in the US people traveling to the coast that that happens a lot that's not incorporated because it's this consistent you know per person generation for that country but then countries that are sort of influenced by that tourism as a whole are their data um, at least appears to be from what my observation of the world bank data appears to be influenced by that um, but that's Again, that would be something that you do, that you drill down into and refine at the country level, right? So that would make a difference there, which is why we recommend that if you're going to do individual countries. So the question about China is, is good as well. And certainly, um, many of our recycling facilities here in the US um, have at least historically, I, I know that there's, try, there's some movement to try and um, reduce this, but I know ours, we still ship our three through seven um, over to China for processing. And this, 
this model does not take that into account. Those are bailed and shipped on the commodity market. So once they're properly managed here and shipped there, they're sort of in the industrial infrastructure in China. And so we didn't then, um, you know, that's not taken into account in the mismanaged waste within China. I mean, it would be handled, you know, how they sort of handle their industrial materials and whether or not that be um, a contributing factor would be another you know, another part of a, a outside the scope of this study, but could be looked at, of course. Excellent. Thanks, Jenna. Um, we'll, we'll wrap it up now. Can you change your screen to your contact oh. information just yes. so that people... Sorry, I forgot. Yeah. Didn't go no, that's, that. that's fine. Um, I think that'll be useful to, to okay. folks who who have may have some questions or uh, are interested okay. in seeing the study or checking out your website, which is really useful. Um, yep. Or your Facebook page, which is also yep. on there. Or follow um, me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> You're very there. accessible. <laughs> yes, I am. Yep. Uh, which is awesome. Um, so thank you for doing this. Again, to the audience, um, thank you for all your questions. We got to maybe half of them. I okay. really appreciate your your um, your, par your participation. And again, the recording of this will be on the marinedebris.info website in a couple hours. We'll send the link to the listserv. Um, Jenna, thank you and congratulations on your work and best wishes for your continued research on this. Okay. Thanks so much for having me. It was a real pleasure. All right. Thank you, everybody.